The catastrophic failure of dams in Qinghai has left thousands missing. A raging fire erupted in a towering 24-story residential building in Liaoning. The CCP is deliberately injecting malicious code into key infrastructure systems abroad. Reasons for the shortened duration of the two sessions in 2024. It's all covered in today's China Truths. The catastrophic failure of dams in Qinghai has left thousands missing, stirring deep outrage and frustration among the affected communities. Recently, Chinese netizens took to overseas social platforms to share harrowing videos of the floods in Qinghai highlighting the magnitude of the disaster that struck on February 21st. Shockingly, reports emerged indicating dozens of deaths and thousands of individuals missing as a result of the unprecedented flood. It's infuriating to learn that the CCP authorities intentionally suppressed this critical news for a staggering 10 days before it was brought to light. This suppression raises alarming questions about the consistent stifling of disaster-related information. Despite the CCP's attempts to downplay the catastrophe, asserting it as a localized flood triggered by the bursting of the Donjazona Lake Dam, they conveniently omitted acknowledging any casualties. This blatant disregard for the lives lost and the thousands missing is utterly disgraceful and has fueled widespread discontent among netizens towards the state media's dismissive narrative. Since March 1, voices on Weibo have relentlessly called for global attention to the Qinghai floods, swiftly making it a trending topic. Heart-wrenching accounts surfaced, depicting the tragic drowning of numerous local sheep and the heroic efforts of herdsmen attempting to rescue them amidst the raging waters. Moreover, eyewitnesses shed light on recent significant icebergs melting, leading to alarming groundwater flow in villages and treacherous icy roads. China Central Television's belated report on February 18 revealed the escalating crisis, with the rising water level of Dongitsana Lake wreaking havoc in Madwa County, Qinghai Province. The subsequent flooding in Dulan County inflicted severe damage, affecting five towns and claiming the lives of countless livestock. However, CCTV's blatant denial of the reported casualties and missing persons further infuriated netizens, who demanded accountability and transparency regarding the embankment collapse. Netizens rightly questioned the inexplicable delay in reporting and suspected intentional information suppression by official media. The timing of the report, only surfacing due to netizens' exposure, adds to the frustration and distrust towards the authorities. Such significant events demand immediate attention and truthful disclosure to prevent the spread of rumors and misinformation. The evident censorship by news media during crises undermines public trust and obstructs objective reporting. Netizens play a crucial role in disseminating vital information, as demonstrated by the necessity of their online postings. The catastrophic failure of the embankment, particularly during the rainy season, underscores the incompetence and negligence surrounding its execution. Online videos vividly capturing the devastation, including the distressing sight of drowned sheep and the valiant efforts of herdsmen, serve as stark reminders of the human and environmental toll of this tragedy. The recent revelations regarding extensive icebergs melting only deepen concerns about the broader ecological impact, underscoring the urgent need for accountability and swift action to address the underlying issues. A raging fire erupted in a towering 24-story residential building in Liaoning, engulfing every floor from bottom to top. The social turmoil in China extends beyond the state media's cover-up of dam breaches to a flurry of consecutive fire incidents. As we step into 2024, mainland China finds itself plagued by a string of relentless fire disasters. On the inaugural day of March, horror struck yet again as flames tore through a 24-story high-rise residential complex in Dandong, Liaoning. Eyewitnesses trembled in disbelief, describing the inferno as more terrifying than a city under siege. According to reports by Sina News, around 19.30 that evening, the towering blaze ravaged through a residential tower in the Shankian Street of Yuanbao District, Dandong. Netizens, who witnessed the catastrophe firsthand, recounted seeing the fire start on the ground floor before rapidly ascending to the very summit. Mr. Lee, another witness to the carnage, recounted the horror that unfolded on that fateful March night at Building 39, Campus Yuanbao District. 
he revealed suspicions that the blaze originated from an outdoor terrace, swiftly devouring all 24 floors. In the wake of the tragedy, a swarm of police cars, fire engines, and 120 ambulances descended upon the scene. Chilling footage circulating online captured the chaos as flames danced from the ground up, with sirens wailing and firefighters battling the inferno. Onlookers gathered, their voices trembling with fear and desperation, questioning whether any lives could be spared amidst the merciless flames. Recent weeks has seen an alarming surge in high-rise residential fires across mainland China. Just days prior, on February 24, another blaze erupted in a residential tower in Jiamusi City, Heilongjiang Province, swiftly engulfing multiple floors. Witnesses reported thick smoke billowing from the building, suffocating residents and rendering them helpless. Tragically, Nanjing officials later confirmed a death toll of 15 souls, with 44 others injured, further underscoring the dire plight faced by the most vulnerable in Chinese society. Moreover, on February 26, the Beijing Fire Rescue Brigade reported a total of 28 electric bicycle fire incidents in the city since February 2024, including one that occurred indoors. According to the Beijing News, the indoor electric bicycle fire was caused by a resident charging the battery. The resident noticed smoke coming from the battery and moved it to the hallway within seconds before it caught fire and exploded. Reportedly, the resident, a man surnamed Liu, lived on the 27th floor of a high-rise residential building in Tanzhou District. On the afternoon of February 22, he brought the original battery of the electric bicycle back to the community. Due to the automatic power cutoff of the charging pile downstairs, he brought the battery home to charge. The man said he was charging the battery on a power strip under the TV cabinet in the living room, but shortly after, the battery started emitting smoke. He immediately moved the battery to the outdoor hallway. Within 10 seconds, the battery caught fire, followed by several intense explosions, casting flames and filling the entire hallway with thick smoke. Recently, in the early morning hours of February 23, a high-rise residential building in Nanjing, Jiangsu Province, caught fire due to an electric bicycle, resulting in at least 15 deaths and 44 injuries. At the time, experts pointed out that the failure of the closed fire doors in the high-rise building to effectively block the spread of smoke was a significant factor contributing to the casualties. However, they avoided addressing the safety hazards of electric vehicle batteries. Veteran commentator Kai Shenkun recently told Radio Free Asia that the safety issues surrounding electric bicycles in China have long been ignored by the authorities. Every time an electric bicycle catches fire, the authorities dismiss it, leading to a proliferation of similar incidents. Kai Shenkun stated that the authorities are unwilling to acknowledge the underlying reasons for electric bicycle or electric vehicle fires. The Chinese Communist Party promotes the new energy industry and globally promotes it, but electric bicycles or electric vehicles have various safety hazards. They, the government, almost always try to cover it up. Once people perceive that electric bicycles have significant safety hazards, it will lead to a shrinking market and even pose a significant threat to its exports, he said. These recurring tragedies serve as grim reminders of the systemic challenges and punitive measures looming over mainland China and the Chinese Communist Party. The CCP is deliberately injecting malicious code into key infrastructure systems abroad. Amidst numerous unrest events happening simultaneously in China, what should be done is to pay attention to honestly addressing the measures to remedy them. However, instead of focusing on this, the CCP only seems concerned with boasting about what they have proudly stolen from foreign entrepreneurs. The CCP has been increasingly embedding malicious codes into critical infrastructure abroad, often utilizing private companies as intermediaries to launch attacks on foreign governments and exert control over domestic populations. Experts emphasize that under the CCP's national intelligence law, there is no distinction allowed between national and corporate interests. Recently leaked internal documents from the Chinese cybersecurity firm Anshuan have exposed the various incentives the company receives for aiding the CCP in cyber attacks against different countries and objectives, each with its own price tag. Anshuan charges 20,000 renminbi, Chinese yuan, to provide access to designated email accounts in India's provincial CCP Public Security Department, offering bi-weekly document retrievals, or access to 10 Indonesian government department email accounts once a week. 
Prices for similar services in Malaysia and the Philippines are even lower. Haria's demands from Europe and the United States command significantly higher figures. According to internal communications from Anshuan employees, a web shell for a U.S. government department fetches over a million RMB. Web shells are malicious scripts commonly employed by hackers to gain operational control over servers. A set of credentials for an American department, like the FBI, typically goes for 100,000 to 150,000 renminbi, wrote one employee. Box refers to email accounts. Leaked documents reveal that Anshuan is among hundreds of Chinese radical hacker enterprises funded by the CCP government, offering a variety of hacker tools and services similar to APT rental services. These documents also contain first-hand communication records between employees, along with target lists and materials showcasing network attack tools. This provides a first look into the world of CCP-backed hacker employment and illustrates how CCP law enforcement agencies, including its main spy agency, the Ministry of State Security, tap into domestic private sector resources for hacking campaigns against foreign entities. Typically, the CCP authorities require Anshuan to first provide samples of stolen confidential information, verify the value of the samples, and then consider placing orders, with some government officials even receiving commissions or benefits from these transactions. Also indicate that in recent years, Beijing has intensified its espionage agenda, shifting from individual spy activities to implanting malicious codes in foreign critical infrastructure, escalating the intensity and technical difficulty of external attacks. This practice of using private contractors for hacking was previously mainly associated with Iran and Russia. It is believed that this change is partly due to CCP leader Xi Jinping's decision to elevate the status of the Ministry of State Security. Previously, CCP hacking activities were mainly concentrated within the military's jurisdiction. However, once these activities are exposed, they can severely damage Beijing's diplomacy and provoke foreign governments. So far, no government spokesperson from any country has commented on this issue. CCP Foreign Ministry spokesperson Hua Chenying said at a Thursday press conference that she was unaware of the Anshuan data leak incident. She then reiterated China's resolute opposition and lawful crackdown on all forms of cyber attacks, a sentiment echoed in the password strings used by an Anshuan employee when encrypting stolen documents. The CCP government does not permit Chinese companies to deviate from its agenda. Anshuan's founder, Wu Haiba, also known as Shutdown, speculated in 2022 about the possibility of facing accusations from the U.S. government similar to APT-41. An executive asked Wu whether someone with CCP security clearance had revealed that Anshuan was under close surveillance by the United States, to which Wu replied, it doesn't matter, it's just a matter of time. Reasons for the shortened duration of the two sessions in 2024 The Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, CPPCC, and the National People's Congress, NPC, collectively known as the two sessions, are scheduled to respectively commence on March 4 and March 5 in Beijing, with an anticipated conclusion before March 12. Beijing is under tight security measures, with the prohibition of various sports, entertainment, and advertising flight activities using low, slow, small aircraft such as drones during the two sessions. Dissidents are facing harassment, and petitioners are being intercepted. Amidst heightened security measures, Epic Times reporters have observed that the overall duration of the two sessions has shortened since the outbreak of the epidemic at the end of 2019. Analysis suggests that this year's shortened duration of the two sessions indicates the severity of the current epidemic on one hand, and on the other hand, the difficulties encountered during the third plenum of the CCP Central Committee, which has led to significant internal conflicts. The longer the duration of the sessions, the higher the likelihood of representatives and members of the two sessions venting their dissatisfaction. Political commentator Lilini further analyzes that another reason lies in the difficulty faced during the third plenum of the CCP Central Committee and the deep internal conflicts. With the Chinese economy facing challenges, the two sessions happen to be the official consultation meetings. The longer the duration of these sessions, the more likely it is for representatives and members of the two sessions to seize the opportunity to express their dissatisfaction. Therefore, an early conclusion to the sessions also takes into consideration the internal stability of the authorities. However, amidst the current situation of internal and external challenges facing the CCP, even if the authorities aim to maintain stability, it may not necessarily be achievable.